Uh, hi everyone. Uh, in today's conversation with authors, we have Pondali, the author behind the Green Bone Saga, which is consi which consists of Jade City, Jade War, and uh, also Jade Legacy, which will be coming out really soon. As you guys probably know already, the Green Bone Saga is one of my favorite series of all time, and I'm truly honored that Pondali has decided to visit this channel. I'm truly, truly thankful. And uh, just to begin with, uh, can you introduce us, Ponda? Sure. Um, I'm really glad to be here, Patrick. It's, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about the series. Um, for those of you who, who are watching and don't know who I am yet, um, I'm Fonda. <laughs> I've written the Greenbone Saga. Um, and before that, I also wrote some um, young adult science fiction novels. I've written a little bit of uh, short fiction and comics here and there. And I'm just thrilled that Jade Legacy will be out in the, wor in the world soon. Mm, awesome. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who are watching this, uh, the first part of this uh, conversation will be spoiler free. And then after that, we will be moving to spoiler territory. I'm not I'm still not sure whether we will cover Jade Legacy or not, but we will definitely talk about Jade City and Jade War. So yeah, I will uh, I will post it. I will post the timestamps. Make sure to check that out. So uh, Jade Legacy will be out really soon. Uh, this is your first adult fantasy series, an absolutely amazing one, by the way. And, and well, it will be ofi officially over really soon. How do you feel about all of this? <laughs> I can barely believe it. Honestly, yeah. I have been working on the series for so long mm. that there were many points along the way where it just felt like it would never be done, that it was impossible. <laughs> so there's yeah. there's a sense of relief that mm. it's coming out and that it's complete and also just a sense of um, sadness because I've spent so long with these characters and in this world that I also don't want to leave it behind um, yeah. and also just happiness pride that it came out the way that I wanted it to when I was starting to write Jade City it felt like such a step up in such an ambitious project. Um, I knew that it was going to stretch my writing to its utmost ability. Mm -hmm. And so I just was you know, crossing my fingers that I could create something that lived up to the vision that was in my head. Because in my head, it, I had this, this grand idea of what it would be, um, but yeah. it's like standing at the bottom of Mount Everest and looking at the top of Mount Everest and not knowing if you can get there. So that's how I feel right now is that I, you know, I'm, I feel like I am right now at the top of Mount Everest and, um, and can't really believe that it, that it's, it's, it's finally happening. Yeah, I still yeah. feel at a little bit of a loss. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with myself yet. <laughs> I'm going to take January off, I think, and just I just rest. Binge Netflix and rest. And <laughs> It'll be fantastic. Catch up on yeah. all the books that I won't mm. be able to read while I'm launching my own book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of ambitious, I've read Jade Legacy, and I think it's definitely your most ambitious book by far. It's so ambitious. And I was wondering, because it felt to me like I was reading an entire trilogy or an entire quartet in one book. Do you, do you struggle writing this? And what helped your writing process for Jade Legacy? So the way that I approached Jade Legacy was I had to break it into pieces because it was so overwhelming to think mm. about at one time. If I mm. tried to um, conceive of the entire thing, my brain would almost like, shut down. So the way that I thought of it was um, almost like a television show. And um, I thought of each of the segments as oh. a season of a TV show. And so oh. each section because I had already planned ahead and I knew that the interludes that I had set up in Jade City and Jade War would be the way that I could move through the larger time frame of Jade Legacy. Uh, Jade Legacy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, and the and the interludes actually move um, with the books as well. So in Jade City all of the interludes um, are ancient myth mm -hmm. and then the Jade in Jade War they are Kekanese history. And then in Jade Legacy, they are more recent history leading up into the Cull family. So and <laughs> the interludes were planned that way to kind of be moving forward in time to kind of catch up with where Jade City begins. 
So oh, that was yeah. like the structure that I'd already established. And I knew I could use those interludes as a way to cover the longer period of time. So each section between the of, of narrative had to have its own um, narrative arc and uh, come to almost like a um, TV series season conclusion. ender mm -hmm. that would still that was kind of, was satisfying but still um, but left a lot of uh, of questions that would then get picked up after the season break which was the yeah. interludes so that was how I conceived of it and that helped me to break it down in a way that was more manageable. And then I just, I really wrote it like e eating an elephant, just one <laughs> bite at a time. <laughs> just had to take it one, one piece at a time. And then I, uh, and then eventually would come into shape and then I could start to see the pieces of the narrative that would span all the sections and would move from section to section and um, start stringing that all together. Oh, it was, uh. um, it was it was quite a process. It's it's crazy. It's too good to be true, but it is real. <laughs> uh, you know that I'm reading this with my co-bloggers, right? And we were all like, "Oh my God, this is amazing! How did you pull this off?" <laughs> so many times, and because you use uh, multiple time skips in Jade Legacy, multiple there is a lot of time skips, and this is very unconventional, especially to use in the last book of a trilogy. Do you, uh, I mean, were you ever scared that this wouldn't work for readers? I mean, so far from early review, early reviews, everything has been so positive about this. I knew going in that uh. um, there are going to be people who don't like time skips and they're just mm. not going to um, jive as well with this final book because it does cover a longer period of time. And I don't think there's a perfect way to mm. cover such a large amount of time in a novel you kind of just have to uh, choose your path mm. and some readers will like it and find it works for them and some may not and as an author I just have to go with what feels right to me that feels mm. like it's um, it's what I would want to read so um, I knew that uh, that there was some different approaches that you could take with with um, handling large time skips, you could do a, you know, five years pass uh -huh. and then, you know, uh, try to, and, and then go to a new section um, and go immediately into that scene. Mm. You could write a intervening chapter that tries to tell the time passing mm -hmm. in narrative. Um, you could do flashbacks. So there's different ways to try and cover a large period of time. The way that I opted to do it was, um, actually based on the musical Hamilton. What? So, really? <laughs> yeah. So this is, so this is the, the principle that I followed because Hamilton is a musical where um, a large amount of time passes. It, yeah, start, it starts Hamilton as a young man and it ends with his death and it has him getting married and having children and the war for independent revolutionary war and the establishing of the Republic. All these things happen in a, in a short me two, two hour odd musical. Yeah, yeah. So I thought about, okay, well, how does that work? And the way it works in Hamilton is you go from important events in his life to the other important events in his life. And all the mm -hmm. stuff that is happening with the, um, in that, that is involving the story of America's founding is seen through his eyes mm -hmm. and is told through the story of his life and, and all the things that are going on with him. And, and you, you move from one piece one spot like let's say there's a there's a song where he's mm. he's singing about um what he hopes for for his son yeah. and then there's another musical number where he where you see his grown son uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you the reader then like the, the viewer the person who's watching it catches up and kind of fills in the context of what's happened in between by moving from important life events to another important life event and then when you move, you fill, you backfill what's happened in between so that mm. the reader is always staying with the character 
and in this case, Hamilton, the viewers yeah. of Hamilton are always staying with Hamilton. And yeah. it's through the connection to him and seeing how his life is changing that you're able to smoothly move through time. So that was the approach that I took with this book was the view always has to be with the characters. If I did a big time skip and then I dropped you with some other random character <laughs> in another country with people you don't know in the context you don't know, then it would be very jarring. But yeah. if you're in the call house mm. and then five years pass and the next scene is you're with the call family still, but mm -hmm. now you see all the things that have changed. The linkage is those characters and you're you're willing, it's like meeting an old friend you haven't seen in a year, two years because of the pandemic. You can't tell. <laughs> and you say, oh, what's, what's happened with your life? You know, what's been going yeah. on in your life over this time? And then you feel like you've caught up with your old friend and, and you're, you're together again. So that's the yeah. approach that I took. Hopefully wow. it works. And I know that like, you know, time skips are always a risk, um, but that was what I needed to do to tell this story. So I just had to find a way to make it work for me and then hope my readers came along with me. Yeah, I understand that. And it definitely worked for me. I think you did, uh, you managed to include all the necessary information and uh, background that was skipped in the time skips, but you filled them very nicely. I really, really love this. And speaking of unconventional, not only the time skip is unconventional, but the Green Bone Saga overall is a bit unconventional compared to a lot of traditional epic fantasy. And I was wondering, do you, uh, was this always your plan from the beginning? And do you have any plans to write traditional epic fantasy in the future, maybe? You know, I didn't really know how I would even categorize it when I started writing it. Mm -hmm. I just started writing the story that was in my mind. And I wasn't, I didn't think of it as an epic fantasy or an urban fantasy. I just mm. had this, this, the, this aesthetic sense of it. I just had vibes. <laughs> this, like, these are the vibes. vibes. <laughs> and, and so I wrote from vibes. Um, and then afterward, you know, then people were like, well, I don't really know whether it's epic fantasy or urban fantasy, but um, you know, it, I, uh, I was definitely inspired by elements of epic fantasy, but mm. also by elements of other genres, um, mm. including urban fantasy and crime drama and wuxia and Kung Fu films. And so when yeah, they yeah. smashed together, it became an unconventional epic fantasy um, by just sort of the nature of the alchemical process of making, mm. <laughs> making the, the story. And would I ever write a traditional epic fantasy? Um, I wouldn't rule it out. Okay. But I don't, I don't know because I often feel most inspired to do the more sort of cross genre Oh, unconventional okay. kind of stories so um if it if 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 i can do that in an epic fantasy uh form or setting i'll do that but i might mm. not and so it's really more um kind of what's the best vehicle for me to tell the story that that i want to tell um so uh, so i don't know maybe but <laughs> but not that's not something that i have a specific goal oh, yeah to. Yeah, whatever you write, I will I will definitely read it. <laughs> and you know, I was watching, I think you have watched this movie, uh Sanchi. I uh, just I just watched Sanchi and it was incredible. I I don't know why, but I keep on thinking of the Greenbone saga when I watched that movie. A lot of the actions, I mean, that could really uh that's something like I, I what I wanted from the Greenbone saga if it's get adapted. And I think uh it's in production right right now. The it's, TV uh, show. it's it's in development so ah, it's in development yeah it hasn't been cast or or the green lit yet but it's mm. um it's in the process of of being developed um but i i did uh i i also really enjoyed shang chi and yeah. um and i think a, one of the things the commonalities with the story that with stories that i wrote is that um there's the the sort of fantastical elements, but also like a really strong family mm. story at the core. And that's, that's what sort of brought me into Shang-Chi. And, and afterwards, I was like, if you want more <laughs> messy alpha Asian families, <laughs> you can read my books. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, loved the, I loved the bus fight scene and, mm. and, uh, and yeah, a lot of a lot of fun with that story. Yeah, and Hilo, Hilo, and Shea can 
it's a bit similar the, their relationship with the main characters of Sanji, <laughs> Hilo <laughs> and Shay. <laughs> messy siblings, yeah, messy yeah. siblings in there, yeah. Yeah, but I was wondering, do you have any preference for maybe adaptation for your work? Oh, I it's you know I um I try to because the show is in in mm. development. On one hand, I so I have to temper myself and mm. emotionally distance a little bit because I don't control that process. Yeah. So yeah. it's best to kind of um, to step back a little bit and just sort of cross my fingers. Um, but while we're in the realm of just like wish fulfillment, it would I would like if someone would adapt my work into an anime, I would just ah. I would pass away. <laughs> 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 I think I think your books would would work amazingly as anime and to be to be honest as anything really I think as manga as anime as TV show or movies it could work that's one of the one that's one of the things that I love so much about the Green Bone Saga and of course uh, the characters the, your characters are some of the best that I've read in fantasy and I've read a lot of fantasy books seriously it is absolutely amazing and I was wondering Thank because you. it in Jet Legacy, there are so many characters now. By Jet Legacy, there are more than 10. Yeah, there are more than 10 POV characters. And do you have any favorite characters to write? And why is it Hilo? It's Hilo, right? <laughs> it, is, it is Hilo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you caught me out. Um, yeah. Uh, I, so I have, I actually love writing each of the POV characters. I, I have mm. to because I spend so much time with them by, you yeah. know, at a certain point I feel like I just know these characters inside and out like I know how they talk how they yeah. walk like even like when a character comes on when I start writing them I just I slip into that the way that character speaks and uh. um but uh I would say I mean Hilo is my favorite character to write because he is such a pure embodiment of the green bone culture mm -hmm. and that world that society and each of the other point of view characters has some uh, struggles and some issues and ambiguities and, and conflicts with that, the Greenbone culture and, and the family. And um, they all have their own sort of different, uh, different sort of outsider status in a way. Um, Right, Andin is feels like an outside. He's very much a yeah. part of the family, but he also is a little. Bit, he's also a bit out, outside of the family, and he takes a different path. Um, when, of course, being a stone eye, mm -hmm. um, Shay, who uh, is, is has such a leadership role, but she's um, a woman in a very patriarchal society. She left and ha has different sort of modern views and came back. And so, like mm -hmm. each of those other characters interacts with the green bone culture. Mm -hmm. um, with some sense of reservation. Well, as Kilo is, he's sort of the pure uh, green, green bone. bone. Yeah. <laughs> and so writing him is like living fully in the world that I created. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so he's, he's where I can just kind of sink in to how green, the green bone culture thinks and works and what, and both, you know, the great things about Hilo reflect some of the, those wonderful positive aspects of that culture yeah. and so his flaws also mm. reflect the flaws the of that culture so yeah. um so i think that's why i i enjoy writing him the most um mm. is is because he's he's like he he's so much a reflection of the world that i created mm. Yeah, and Hilo is my favorite character, which is saying a lot because there are a lot of favorite characters in the Green Bone Saga series. And he's just such a passionate character, and it's it's hard not to get passionate when talking about him. <laughs> it's hard. And, you know, uh, you speak about uh, his uh, personality reflect the good and the bad of the Green Bone culture, and I think that's the part that divides a lot of readers uh, well. Uh, love for his character because right. he made he made well questionable actions right? right he made questionable actions and well i was wondering did when when you i, I cannot spoil this yet but uh when hilo did a lot of uh, some of those questionable actions the, uh, i mean were they something that float naturally from the characters as you wrote or something that you plan this will have to happen or something like that 
I, a little bit of both. Oh, so okay. I, uh, there's, there's some element of, I know where the story is going and mm. what like the, the end, what I have to do to set up some of the things that happen. Mm. Um, but, and so I know there will be these big turning points, but also I reach those turning points by kind of looking into the characters and what are the natural consequences of, of their actions and their motivations. And so I, I don't really, I feel like it's both. I feel mm. like it's an iterative process. Um, and, uh, and each of the characters, when they make some big decisions, mm. usually there's a plot reason, but there's also, um, the, I reach the plot by looking into what would make sense. So I'll give you an example. Um, mm. uh, there's a big duel in the middle of Jade War. Uh, okay, and, yeah, yeah. And, um, and that happens as a result of uh, a decision on the part mm. of Shay. And, mm. But um, I, that duel did not initially exist when I outlined the book. And now it is impossible to think <laughs> that it could not, right? It is such a yeah. focal point of that story. But when I initially outlined the book, it didn't exist. And as I was writing, I realized, you know, there's, there's a lot of tension, but it's not, there's something in the middle of the book is missing. There's something missing mm. in, this, in the middle of the book. And I thought, well, what is it? What, what's missing? Well, okay, there's a few things missing. First of all, um, I don't, uh, I, I feel like, you know, one of these characters is, is not being used well enough. Also, I don't, mm. I feel like the viewers don't have a good sense or the readers haven't seen Aitmada, the antagonist much lately. Uh, like, what is she up to? Yeah. And like, there's all the, so I, I knew there was something kind of, something that I needed to put in there. And then the solution came about because I looked into the characters and said, well, what would they really be doing? Like, what would logically they be doing? Uh, and, yeah, yeah. And then like, how do I solve like a number of these problems by, um, by like having this big event and the event has to also feel natural to the past. And, and by looking into like Shay's past and how mm. the motto would work. And it's like, okay, now I can see how those pieces line up. And then like the answer presents itself. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's definitely a bit of both. And going back to Hilo, I knew that uh, I'm, I'm really proud of having written a character who's so divisive because <laughs> to me, that's proof that he feels like a real human being because real human beings are divisive. Anyone yeah. in that kind of position of power with that sort of influence who has to make those sorts of difficult decisions would be very divisive as a person. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, for for Hilo to to be a divisive personality I, I is like it it makes me happy because that's uh that to me means that um that, he that he's real he's yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly that, that that he he feels real and every um and and of course I know that like every narrative choice um will bring will pull some readers closer and push some up mm. readers away. And that's kind of all part of, of sort of the, dis the decision maker as a, as a writer is that you, you want to keep surprising the reader and upping the stakes in a way that feels natural and, uh, and, and, you know, let readers make up their own minds about the characters. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> and uh, uh, speaking of Hilo and many characters, I think one of the things that made them so, uh, work so well is that I know that you receive a lot of uh, praises for your battle scenes and they are fantastic, but I think you should receive more praises for your dialogues. I think the dialogues in this series are incredible. They have as much tension, maybe sometimes even more than the actual battle scenes. And I was, I just want to ask about this and how do you go about writing all of this? And what do you think make this work so well for a lot of readers? I know that some readers have praised uh, the dialogues as well. I'm really, really glad to hear you say that because I feel <laughs> like I put even more effort into the dialogue scenes mm. than the mm. action scenes. Like I love writing the action scenes. And I mm. think those are, the, they're often the ones that people remember because they're very dramatic and yeah. they're death and so on. But um, but the dialogue scenes are the ones that really stretch me as a writer because oh. they are they 
have to they have to accomplish oftentimes mm. um, a lot of things at once. They ha- they have to convey information. They have to move mm. the plot forward. They also have to reveal character. Mm. They might also have to do some world building. So they have to accomplish a lot and so much of character is revealed in the way that they communicate with others. And there's so many scenes in this story where I am trying to, con- trying to convey a certain sense of tension mm. um, with, and there's so many different types of tension because there's like a tension of a political mm. uh, negotiation there's those scenes that are very interpersonally tense because they're between family members. And there's other ones where, you know, I'm, there's, there are emotional ones like between Hilo and Wen you know, yeah. in the conversation. So um, I often feel like I, I revise those scenes a lot to try and just mm. hit a specific emotional note and often to strip out everything that is unnecessary because when real people talk to each other, we don't, say things directly we have there's a lot that's unsaid especially Mm. between characters who have a long family history and so they don't just say you don't want the dialogue to feel like it's too scripted yeah Um, i want the dialogue to feel like it's natural like how how people would really relate in like Mm. a in a conversation they wouldn't say everything so sometimes i i'm stripping things out um, and trying to put it, it, make it more subtle. So that's the thing about the dialogue scenes. I'm always trying to make it more subtle. Well, it's like the action scene gets more, it, it's very large and lives on the page in like a very vivid way. Yeah. And often with the dialogue scenes, like how do I convey what's happening, but do it, do it subtly. And that, yeah. that takes, a, it ends up t- taking a lot of a lot of fine tuning. <laughs> it's ima- it's really amazing though, and I think you convey not only emotion but a lot of tension. And there's a lot of tension when people just talk. <laughs> right. It's intense. It's really intense. And there's uh, as I said, there's a lot of praises for the Green Bone Saga. And do you do you think that these praises make you uh, struggle more as a writer, especially for your future books? Uh, yes, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, um, because uh, while you're writing a series, it was, I think with a single book, it's easier mm. because mm. you write it and it's done and there's nothing yeah. else you can do to it. When you're writing a series, it's more difficult because you're getting feedback on the first book while you're writing the second and then the second book while you're writing the third. So each time you are... Uh, you have noise in the background and when it's um when it when if if it's critical and people don't like something then it Mm. might make you doubt yourself when it's it it's very positive it can also be pressure and it makes you feel like oh how am i possibly going to live up with the next book because you know people will say something really wonderful about your book but then you go look at your current manuscript and it's just in pieces and it's a mess. <laughs> and you look at it and you just feel this plummeting sense of despair. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so it is hard. And I think the only thing, but that is also part of the, just the nature of being a professional author is mm. that you have to learn to accept all the feed, the noise that's going on in the background and then also shut it out and remember that you are writing your you your your duty is to your vision mm. and uh, to yourself first as an author and as a reader and then you trust that if you write the book that is true to your vision and that satisfies you that other people will see the vision and also be satisfied and that's kind of all you can do but that but there is certainly a sense of pressure that comes along with it like one on one hand like right now on one hand i'm like well what am i possibly going to do now like i've been this giant <laughs> trilogy like where do i go from here um and then another part of me so a part of me is like oh i w- wants to do something um that will satisfy readers of the Greenbone saga and then another part of me wants to do something brand new and something very different and then part of me is like oh I just need a a break I'm just going to write short stories for a while so you kind of have to to 
take all that into account and then um, sort through it and then just set it aside and just write what what you need to write. And yeah. That's all you well, can do. Well, you definitely have succeeded so far in my opinion. Jade War is better than JCD and Jade Legacy is better than well, everything that you've wrote. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, well, I'm, I'm just so, I'm really glad to hear that and, and relieved because each time I wrote one of the books, I kept mm. thinking, this is where it could fail. Because the first book, <laughs> the first book, <laughs> if no, if they don't, if people don't like the first book, they won't usually go to the second and third book. So the first book has uh, to yeah. draw people in. Yeah. And then the whole time I was writing Jade War, I thought, oh, everyone talks about second book syndrome and mm. the saggy middle and the second book is make it or break it. So the second book has to be like, I, it has to be great. And so I felt a lot of pressure with the second book. And then, but yet once the, and, and while I was writing, I was like, I just need to get through the second book. Third book will be easier. And then it wasn't. <laughs> the third book was even harder. <laughs> because, like, and now it has to stick the landing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Book. And, yeah. So every book is hard, is the hardest. The hardest book is always the book you're currently writing. Wow. <laughs> uh, but hey, guess what? You're now are getting a, a Lumicrat edition. This is your first special edition, right? This is your first yes. one, right? Well, hopefully this will be the first of many. And do you have like any favorite book cover or edition? Um, of books in general? Yeah. Or my books in particular? Nah, books in general. Books in general. Yeah. Um, you know, I, so the, um, my Illumicrate edition will be the first special editions that I uh, own. Nice. And, <laughs> yeah. I, and, uh, and I, I'm going to tell you, I just received them. I got, just got my author copies. What? No! <laughs> <And I'm> not, <laughs> just less than 48 hours ago, I got them. And they're... they're, they're I'm not going to say anymore. I want everyone to experience it for themselves when they, when they open the box. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, now there, I, I, there's some... I will say there's some... Uh, I love beautiful books but i don't mm. actually own very many i feel like i uh. have so many books but but um i really love so there's this um uh the ursula le guin um ha, the earth sea series has ah. like amazing like it's like i don't know 75 or 100 dollars but it's like it's, <laughs> it's this brick but it's so beautiful yeah it's an yeah. amazing addition um and the uh i really like the new anniversary cover of dune oh um, yeah yeah that's gorgeous yeah, yeah, yeah. that was really beautiful and um the new leviathan wakes 10th mm -hmm. anniversary edition mm -hmm. looks great too yeah yeah orbit is doing a lot of great jobs <laughs> uh you have come quite a long way in your writing career so I, instead of focusing on the negative and the difficulty i just want to ask what's your favorite moments in your writing career so far Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. There are a lot. Um, yeah. Gosh. I mean, I think there's sort of the expected ones, which are like the first book mm. deal, the first time oh, you see yeah. the shelf. But honestly, a lot of my favorites are um, the ones where I get like some connection with readers, like the, the first getting fan art is always yeah. such a joy um the you know getting an email at a t on a day that's when the writing is is hard mm. and getting that email from a reader saying i read your books and i love them and they meant so much to me and those moments are are just so precious they're, they're still, yeah they are they're just so precious and as a writer i spend so much time working alone mm. and so far ahead of the publishing process that while I'm working, it's almost, it's hard to see the day when the book will be out and it'll be read by someone because it yeah. could be a year, two years away. Yeah. And so I sort of just have to have faith that this will be done <laughs> and that it will go out in the world and that people will like it. Um, and so when I, when I do get those messages or I see somebody, like, I mean, some of the fan art I've gotten is like amazing. Yeah. And just, like, oh, wow. Like somebody <laughs> liked these characters enough to actually put their own creativity into it. Um, and then 
uh, you know, moments like, I, I mean, of course, um, winning the World Fantasy Award was a huge nice. moment. <laughs> I mean, my, and I just, it was really precious to me because my editor was there, um, ah, Sarah yeah. Guan, who Sarah Guan. first acquired, acquired the Green Bone Saga. And she, um, she, so she was there and, and got to celebrate with me. So that was, that was really meaningful. And then um, little moments like, um, like going into a bookstore and, and seeing your book on a shelf or, or doing a book signing and having, uh, you know, people come up and, 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 and having that like moment of connection. I've had uh, a lot of great ones. I even had this one where I was, um, I was doing a book signing and a reader uh, came up to me this is after Jade City and said, uh, I'm an accountant. I just want to thank you for representing accounting when Shay goes and does the audit of the Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I felt really touched <laughs> as someone who was a business major. It's like, oh, yes. So, um, yeah, lo- I, I, I think there's the, there are those big, great moments, the book deal, the book mm. launch, and then there's all these little moments. And I think the little moments together add up and they make you feel like what you do matters. Yeah. You know, like that, that someone on, is actually reading your words and, it, it, and it's just, um, as an author, uh, you can take pride in the fact that you just put a good thing into the world. Exactly. Right? Like there's lots of jobs that can't claim that. Yeah, books are just and and stories are just they're an unmade mitigated good thing. So at the mm. end of the day, I am just putting something good into the world that hopefully people enjoy, and that that's always tr- I try to keep that in mind. Nice, <laughs> and I have to agree though because without books, I wouldn't be where I am today. <laughs> it's really an amazing thing, books and stories. And well, before we move on to the spoilery section, I think this will be the end of the spoiler-free section. So anything you want to say uh, to your future readers of Jade Legacy before we move on to the spoiler stuff? I just want to say thank you, really, for, um, for joining me on this journey. It has really been a journey. And um, I, I have been especially just gratified by reviewers like you, readers who <laughs> picked up Jade City, uh, took a chance on it years ago and followed me along mm-hmm. for all this time and, and spend all this time in KCON with me and with the Call family. And um, now I put my heart and soul into the books and I hope that you enjoy it. I hope, I hope people like the final, the way that it ended. Yeah, well, I love this. I hope that's enough endorsement. <laughs> uh, so yeah, for those of you who are watching this right now, we will be moving to spoiler stuff and we, we will just be covering like some of the key points from each book. And for the first one, we will be talking about JCD. So if you have read JCD, you're safe here. So JCD, obviously I will be talking about, well, the main the main shocking event, which is Lance, Lance death. <laughs> Lance death was brutal. It was unexpected i didn't expect it to happen but it's probably the biggest the biggest event that set out to all the all the key points of the series starts from there especially for hilo becoming a pillar so this is was this always planned from the beginning <laughs> this one yeah i i knew from the beginning that it would happen <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and yes and um and it was it, it, i had to uh I had to set it up in a way that was uh, that was painful because actually when I first when I wrote the first draft, mm. I showed it to some readers, and they said, "Oh, I didn't feel like it was that sad." <laughs> and, oh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so this is the first draft. So okay. I thought, well, okay, why why would that be? And what I realized is like we didn't uh, get to. It, the reason why it wasn't hitting as hard as I needed it to was because I hadn't, um, I hadn't f- developed Lon enough so that people really got to know him. Oh. And so I did a lot of revision in the first half of Jade City to really get to know Lon well, to like flesh him oh. out, to spend a lot of time with him and become very attached to him. And um, I had to make it, uh, it, it the, for me, the, the deaths and the emotional scenes in this series only work if they hit me 
And that's like, oh. that's my only calibration of whether or not they will work with readers is does it emotionally hit me? Um, and um, I think the, the thing that really makes for makes Lon's death hard is that um, I build him up as a, as a strong character who has mm. struggles, but you can imagine him succeeding. Like you can see how he would be able to, um, to, to get out of this situation and to prevail against the enemies and to bring yeah. the family together. And, um, and it feels like his, I, I think the tragedy of death in general, especially of, of people who are young, is the sense of unfulfilled potential. Mm. Like, it's just that there, it's so, um, such a loss because they had a, they had a path, they had an arc and it just feels almost meaningless that it was cut off. So that's what I needed to go for um, in order to, to make Lon's death reverberate through the whole trilogy. Yeah. And it's, um, and he keeps, his influence still has is felt through the next yeah. books mm -hmm. um, in a way that even I'm a little bit surprised by, because if you think about it, he's only alive for less than half, eh? about half, half yeah. The but... first book, yeah. which is the shortest book. So he's probably only in the entire series, like uh, 15, <laughs> maybe like, <laughs> um, you know, twenty percent of the yeah. <laughs> of the book of the of the uh, the trilogy, but his influence is so great, mm -hmm. and he's still like a main character up there with with the rest of the siblings. Yeah, um, he and, be, yeah. yeah. So that was that was that was a hard <laughs> that was hard to do. <laughs> and well, he was also Hilo and Shea's uh, rock, right? He was right. There. Yeah, they all rely on Lan and. Well, I think we as readers just kind of think, well, this this is the real main character. He will survive everything, <laughs> but no. And to make things even worse, he's dead because of that stupid barrel. <laughs> 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 yeah. So yeah, I think you all. Uh, I think you already know how how legendary barrel is by now. <laughs> 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 did, you, did you ever expect him to be this popular? I mean, whether he's hated or loved, I don't know who would actually love him, but yeah, he's so popular right now in the Green Book Saga. You know, uh, I think that by the time people get to Jade <laughs> Legacy, Legacy <laughs> they can't, uh, at least the sense that I get is they have, whether you admit it or not, a lot of readers have a certain affection for Barrow by this <laughs> point. <laughs> No. <laughs> Deep down, yeah, yeah. people feel some. Uh, you can't help but admire him on some level mm. because he's so persistent, and um, he is a surprise to me too. Because oh. I initially conceived of Barrow as a framing device, because I intended for him to be in the first chapter of Jade War and the last chapter of Jade War. I mean, sorry, the first chapter of Jade City and the first chapter, last chapter of Jade City. So I intended ah. for him to just be capping the ends of the book because, ah, okay. um, so he was kind of like a George R. R. Martin style minor character that shows mm. up in the first chapter and dies. That was kind mm. of my plan mm. because um, it would be really hard to open the first chapter with, Hilo and the Make Brothers and the discussion uh, of the clan. And that was um, a lot of information to give to a reader right off the bat. If I opened yeah. with the point of view of somebody in the clan, Barrow mm -hmm. was a way for me to show how this world worked and to show the power of Jade and why Jade is coveted through yeah. the eye of a very simple minded character <laughs> because he just. These are simple motivations. So yeah. I'm like, this thief, he will be a great way for me to introduce this world. And he will set up the, the, the introduction of Hilo in a dramatic way because he's going to steal this jade. And yeah. then my plan was, you know, either he's going to get killed, like uh, either 
you know, kills him in that first chapter, or maybe somehow he escapes, but then by the end, <laughs> then Hilo finds him and kills him. So that was my initial plan. And it didn't work out that way, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Pharaoh walked onto the page and then he stayed there. Uh. And he became so useful to me because <laughs> he was, first of all, um, a view of Kacon and the clans outside of the uh, outside of the clan. So he had mm. truly an outsider perspective. And he could go to all these places and show um, the sort of seedy side of Kacon, the disadvantaged kind of ugly, you know, side of, of people who didn't have Jade and, and have no power in that society. And he was also uh, an embodiment of luck and chaos. Uh. And luck and chaos are big, um, they're, they're big factors in the series yeah. and characters are always talking about luck. Yeah. and about the luck of the gods and there's this sense of of fate and mm. chaos and barrow's kind of the like literal embodiment <laughs> of that force <laughs> yeah. and and so he became he was he was so i'm he, he's a character that i initially didn't think would amount to much mm. um and then when i started writing he just he he, he just grew into his role and and stayed and every time I started writing him it was refreshing because uh, the, the call family has so much going on they have a lot of power they have a lot of struggles there's a lot of politics and war and danger in their lives um, and they're think they have a lot of things going on and Barrow usually only has one thing going on it's usually some yeah. disaster <laughs> <Yeah. And> so, <laughs> And so it was really refreshing to just get to a Barrow chapter. And I, and I know readers will get to a Barrow chapter and be like, God damn it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Almost all the time. <laughs> Almost all the time. <laughs> but yeah, I have to admit that having him as one of the POV characters really make the series more varied and more distinctive. It's, he's, he's an incredible character. I have to admit that. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, that's for Jade City. We will now be moving to Jade War. There will be a full spoiler for Jade War here, and we will be talking about key points and also, well, the development of the characters after what happened in Jade City. So the first one that we will be talking about is, well, Hilo taking Nico. <laughs> so this is probably the most divisive uh, action by, by Hilo, and this is usually the one that divides people's opinion on him. And well, I just I just wanted to know what's your thought about this scene. Well, I knew it would be divisive, <laughs> yeah. and I yeah. I loved it for that reason because <laughs> um, it is uh, it's one that people can uh, they can absolutely have a, a very viscerally negative reaction to what he mm. did, but they can't argue with the fact that it is in character for him, mm. and it is uh, you know it's very um it's a moment in which i wanted to you know it, it, in a way it reminds you of of who we're dealing with here yeah yeah and you know that this isn't just uh, sort of a, a a story about uh you know the war between uh, the no no peak in the mountain it's a yeah. family legacy story and these characters are ones that um, that live with violence and use yeah. violence. And um, part of the, their war uh, is, is also an, an internal one to preserve yeah. family legacy. And uh, it, makes, it, it makes perfect sense that like Hilo would not allow Lon's son yeah. to, be, to be taken away from the family. And um, I think people are, uh, and I'm speculating here, but yeah. I think people become divided by this scene based on how much they are able to uh, internalize or accept the, the principles of the green bone culture mm -hmm. and whether or not they have bought into that worldview. And if you are looking at it from Hilo's point of view, uh, 
uh, he tried, well, he did everything he could yeah. to come up with a solution. And he, he was left with no other choice. And, mm. um, you know, there's a scene where he goes back and he talks mm. to Shay and he says, well, you know, would you have rather I, I left Nico and gave yeah. him up? And yeah. she can't answer, right? Um, yeah. And so, like, there's, I, I think that, like, uh, you know, you can, you can absolutely, if you, that is also a moment. I think it's the moment where people get jolted in a way that makes them realize actually, uh, this moral code is one that, like, I can't agree with, and therefore I can't agree with Hilo, mm. or not even agree with, but like, I can't, uh -huh. like, uh, that that is like so. Um, viscerally uh, abhorrent to me um and and those who are like well Hilo did what he did because mm -hmm. he is who he is in the position that he's in in the society that he was brought up in um and uh and yeah like I I I love that scene because um it's you know there's moments in I've, I've talked about how gangster films yeah. Um, and uh, and crime dramas were one big inspiration for the Greenbone saga. And there are moments in some of my favorite ones that are just sh like unexpected, shocking violence. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they're some of the most effective, in my opinion, is not the ones that necessarily build. There's there's the great action scenes that have the slow build of tension, mm. and then there's the scenes that are just sudden violence and they come out of nowhere and that's the scene that i think i think this is one of those scenes yeah definitely and uh i think those sh uh, shocking moments it's, it's one of the best thing about the greenbone saga you can shift a peaceful event well relatively peaceful <laughs> uh, a relatively peaceful event to immediately a very destructive event and this is not just about hero taking nico there is also well uh she she offering the clean blade to uh, Aitbada. That's that also happened suddenly because she just got out of an abortion, <laughs> and mm -hmm. then she just came back and I'm offering a clean blade. What? <laughs> 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 That's so crazy. And then there's also uh, the car bombing, the car bombing in Jade yeah. War. So yeah, I think it's all fantastic. Really, <laughs> it's so so good. And I uh, there's also uh, Anden. Uh, his role in Espinia becoming something so large in the series, especially by Jade Legacy. It's something mm -hmm. that I didn't, I didn't, I, I honestly didn't predict it would be that big. But well, I think, uh, I think you really succeed at something there because well, it's it's all flowed naturally and it converged really well in Jade Legacy. Do you do you feel like this is something that you've always wanted to do since uh, you put Anden in Espinia? So I knew. <laughs> that Andin would be uh, a character whose arc, whose journey was one of, of finding his own path and uh. kind of reconciling these different aspects of his identity and his upbringing and, and making his own fate out of it. Um, and I will tell you, I will not, go into spoilers for Jade Legacy yet. Mm. But the final scene with Andin in Jade Legacy has been in my mind for a ver for years. Wow. So I've known where Andin ends up um, oh. for a very long time. And, uh, <clears throat> and so then the question was, how, how does he get there? Yeah. And um, I knew that he would reject Jade at the end of Jade City. Mm. And then in Jade War, um, when uh, I have him sent to Espenia, then I like started to see how the pieces would come together because Andin's storyline across the saga is in many ways a parallel to the development and the evolution of uh, Kekanese culture and green bone mm. society um, in the way that like he has, he's, He's in. He's going abroad, and he's um, taking all these sort of different things that he experiences and he learns, and he's bringing them back to the clan, and they're changing the clan, and 
um, strengthening it in these unexpected ways. And, um, and that's, that was very, that's in many ways sort of a metaphor for just the modernization and, and the, the development of the clan in, a, in this, um, this modern global sort of era. Uh, and so the, the reason why I um, have this whole subplot with Andin in Jade War going to Aspenia is that um, I wanted to explore that idea of cultural diaspora, uh, uh-huh. which is something that I haven't seen that much of in fantasy mm-hmm. stories. Is there's of course there is Kcon and it has its jade, and I think um, in if I'd set this in a in an ancient time period, it would just be about the jade warriors on Kcon. Yeah, I mean, it could be like a traditional fantasy of jade and warriors on Kcon and different, you know, maybe invaders and beating back the invaders, but that's where it would end. Um, but this isn't that. It's a modern yeah. story and it takes place in a world that's pretty recognizable to our own from near past. And so uh, the role of cultural diaspora and the fact that people move and there's an ethnic, you know, immigrant, there's an immigrant community in Port Massey and Andon yeah. becomes a part of that. And that community is different from the community that he grew up with, like the, mm. the, the Kekanese who are back in Kcon. Um, and then, you know, later on, it, 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 there's there's other, you see Kekanese in other countries too. Mm. And so like, they should all feel, if I've done my job right, they should feel different because they are different. Um, and that was just very personal to me because growing up as, as Asian Canadian and being part of a diaspora, it didn't yeah. feel right to me to tell a story that was, inspired by uh, Asian cultures and nations in our world and not go into the element of, of diaspora because that's what I know personally. Yeah, mm. yeah, that makes sense. And I, I can certainly understand that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this, is one, this is why I think the Green Bone Saga, I think clicked with me so much because you make sure that actions, decisions, every single thing matters. Everything connects from one to another. and like for example, I think when when what what she ended up doing, and well, even though it goes against Hilo at the end of Jade War, well, <laughs> I, I I don't know how to say this, but I kind of agree with her also, but I also at the same time don't agree with her. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's also amazing, really. And what do you think about that? What do you think about the final scene in Jade War? Uh, I uh, I. <laughs> I, I will say um, I'm really haunted by uh, Ron Toro's death. Oh, uh, that no. hit me <laughs> more than I expected it would, honestly. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, when, um, what happens to her at the end of Jade War mm. uh, is, it, it is also a consequence of all of her decisions. Yeah. And so when is she's a she's a fan favorite in a lot of ways because yeah. she is a stone eye, but she still very much wants to be part of the business and to support her family and to be independent and um and and to I mean she takes huge risks. She does, mm. she takes huge risks. Um, but those also those have consequences. She's she mm. is going against um, you know, Hilo trying to keep her safe. Yeah. She is putting herself in danger, um, and, and and you know this isn't a story where just because I I like the characters' determination and pluck that they are safe. Like they're not. Yeah. Sometimes no. your determination <laughs> and pluck lands you in a in a terrible in terrible situations. So um, so yeah, I, that that's very true. I wanted every character's even the characters admirable decisions can mm-hmm. lead to terrible consequences yeah. and some of their terrible decisions can lead to positive outcomes for them too yeah. and that's just kind of the complexity of life um, mm-hmm. that I wanted to reflect that you shouldn't be able to assume oh just because I like this character I agree with what she's doing that she's safe she's, she's yeah. not yeah <laughs> I remember that one scene in Jade War uh uh, it was Barrow, yeah, 
Barrow was talking in front of Hilo, and Hilo doesn't realize who he is. <laughs> well, I, 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 I almost went bald at that scene. <laughs> no, he's right in front of you. <laughs> it's amazing. It's really amazing. <laughs> But yeah, so now we're we're going to move to the big spoiler section for Jade Legacy. So yeah, I think. Uh, a lot of you may uh, haven't read Jade Legacy, so please, please do not continue beyond this point. This is only for those who have uh, watched Jade Legacy, who have read Jade Legacy. And well, if you have read Jade Legacy uh, in the future, come back to this video and watch this next section because we have something to discuss about. Jade Legacy has a lot of pivotal events, so many. <laughs> so yeah, the first one, obviously, to continue from what I just talked about earlier, it's about Hilo and when relationship. So yeah, so the beginning, pretty much the first, uh, the first section of Jade Legacy, is quite hugely focused on the repercussion of the end of the end of Jade War. Yeah, and I think uh, Hilo again made questionable decisions here, and but again, it's also kind of in character. It's in character of him to, well, he's in a lot of pain, and he it's kind of understandable for him to do that. And one of the things that I really love about this is that Hilo and Wen, even though they're beloved, beloved couple by a lot of fans and myself included, but their relationship is not smooth. It's not smooth mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. It's definitely not smooth. And I think that's part of what makes their relationship felt so real. It's so real, especially in Jade Legacy. And do you struggle writing this? Uh, yes, <laughs> um, because it is. It was a very uh, delicate balance to yeah. walk yeah. because um, I I absolutely wanted to portray them going through very difficult rocky period of their marriage mm. and coming out of it um, stronger and that is uh, that's hard to do <laughs> because uh, you know you could easily ring false in some way you can have the, them become completely unsympathetic you can have mm. it feel like they're resolved too easily mm. um you could have the f- drag on and people just get frustrated why can't they solve their problem so there's there is a, a the most important thing for me was did it feel emotionally authentic or does this feel like uh how it would really play out and that they could they would go through such a difficult period and how would they, how would they fix that? Um, because they, I mean, they really do hurt each other, um, but they yeah. also really love each other. Mm-hmm. And so there was always, every scene that I had with them together in that first part of Jade Legacy was trying to portray that duality of how much they both, uh, how, mu- how much pain they're in from, because of each other and also their love for their the love for each other that they're trying to hang on to. So, um, so yeah, I, in fact, I rewrote, I would say uh, that first section of Jade Legacy um, was, was rewritten uh, more than the others because wow. it had both um, that relationship between Hilo and Wen and the growing relationship between Shay and Wu. Yeah. And I was balancing both of those along with all the plot that like happens in that first yeah. <laughs> quarter of the book. Uh, so that would, and, and, you know, it has to, uh, it has to uh, handle all that emotional weight, but not slow down the narrative. Yeah. Uh, but I think actually that I, uh, the, the, before I handed the book in, um, I rewrote that whole first quarter of a book almost wow uh, at least two or three times i think <laughs> that, that is insane <laughs> and i think it which uh, as i mentioned earlier in this conversation and in my review and well each part felt felt like reading a book on its own and this one hit hit its conclusion in hilo asking when to become a pillar man <laughs> oh my god that scene was amazing absolutely amazing <laughs> it was so powerful especially after dealing with uh what happened to one of the mike brothers right yeah uh, it was so 
it was crazy. And I think you did an excellent job on that one. <laughs> excellent job on that. And well, what do you think about that scene in general as you write about it? I mean, after the after what happened and then to uh, to uh, to Hilo uh, asking mm-hmm. when becoming mm-hmm. a pillar man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that I knew was going to be an emotional scene because it yeah. was ringing you out in two different ways. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, like Tar and what happens to him um, is also a like natural consequences situation, mm-hmm. right? Like he is he, Tar's uh, role in the saga up until then is such that it's just almost is tragic but also uh, um, an under when it happens it's an understandable yeah. tragedy um, and so there's uh, I, I think that's like a moment of of uh, catharsis catharsis mm. and, and um, it's it's also a catalyst for for Hilo and when, because yeah. they're both so close to Tar. Um, and the, them kind of having to cope with that tragedy in the moment and, and Hilo reaching for when and yeah. when, when reaching for Hilo. Um, so, so yeah, that was, that was, that was uh, I, I, I knew that one was, that, that is a scene that I knew would happen um, pretty early on. Uh, and then I had to, to make it work by doing all those other scenes yeah. earlier that made that led up to Hilo and and when beginning their reconciliation really there and that it had to feel like that was the right like th- that was the right place in their emotional journey. Ah, it's so good. It's so good. Just talking about it again made me remember it. Again. <laughs> it's incredible. And the book hasn't even been out yet. I think a lot of readers will be so amazed by what you did. And not just this one, but in everything, especially the second part. Uh, this, this is the part that stressed me out probably the most. <laughs> it, this one is so damn stressful. <laughs> you know what scene I'm talking about is the KGA oh, bombing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was insane. Not only it happened, it, it happened so brutally, but uh, as as she and Ander wait for the news, we also have to wait for the news. <laughs> I think that was one of the longest time I've hold my breath without even realizing it. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> insane. That was insane. Do you feel stressed writing that scene? Yes. I mean, fortunately, I know what happens. Oh, yeah. However... <laughs> <laughs> However, it is still stressful um, because I have to kind of uh, uh, live the stress through the characters and, and yeah. make that. I mean, I um, I was I really was excited for to write that scene in the KJA meeting mm-hmm. where Ait Mata is is nearly killed, and um, and I love that scene because up until that moment, she seems so tough, right? Like mm-hmm. Ait Mata is such a tough character who never sees it, lets anyone see her in a moment of weakness or yeah. or you know stress she's always always in control and um there are people you know readers who because of that would think well how does no peak have a chance i thought it was just mm. she's a chess master she's always on top of her game she's perfect in you know a strategist uh, as a leader you know but they are only seeing this the whole story is from the no peak clan's point of view mm. and so you don't see what i mada's uh struggles are on her side yeah. um, however there are natural consequences to the way she rules her clan as well um and you know it may seem like kind of a a, a, a victory for mm. her at the end of Jade War when she wipes out this family and retakes control. And if you're a Mountain Clan loyalist, you're like, yeah, I want to like, you know, <laughs> on top again. But, um, but those have, you know, that has consequences. Yeah, and someone, totally. you know, not a, she's, she's going to, uh, she, the fact that she has um, left a, a potential enemy alive who comes back to get her in that moment um, mm. is something that felt very like possible because of the way that she, you know, she runs her clan. Um, so yeah. having that then plus the bombing, then plus all the, 
this dress. And plus, I just love putting those characters in these untenable situations, like where mm. Shay has to, she's in the temple and she has to make that fateful decision about what she does. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, so my whole philosophy with characters is um, put them in situations where they uh, are just in a pressure cooker where they have no good options. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, always. That's, that's the, the best way to, 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 to advance the, the narrative is like your characters really reveal who they are when they have to make terrible decisions. Um, yeah. And that's the more terrible decisions I, ha I give them, the better. <laughs> It's terrible. And, you know, even though this this world is very harsh on the characters and the characters uh, constantly make uh, morally great uh, actions, but the, your series definitely doesn't belong in the green dark category. It definitely doesn't. There's still hope. There's still love. And I think we all know who the protagonists and who the antagonists are. And uh, maybe will you ever write green dark fantasy? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Um, yeah. I am I I doubt it only mm. because um, I've said this before because someone has I've been asked oh. about morally gray characters mm -hmm. and my answer has been that I don't tend to write I don't actually write morally gray characters mm. I write morally gray societies uh, okay. and yeah. the characters are doing their best mm. to live up to to within this society they're, they 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 live in a society that puts certain pressures on them and that forces them to make certain decisions and choices so all of these characters they're not really morally gray when you judge mm. them through the lens of the society that they live in um and so that's why i don't i'm not sure i'll ever write grimdark to the point where i actually have like i'm not sure i'll really write a like bleak <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah. um something that is bleak because mm -hmm. i i do always tend to write characters who are trying their best mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah understandable and you know uh back to that kga bobbing because i mother was stabbed so quickly and i mean it all makes sense that this captain will stab her <laughs> this it, it makes sense and i think that's one of the that's the importance of side characters in your books i mean Let's talk about Lot Jin. Lot Jin in <laughs> Jade City. Come on. I mean, I wouldn't even expect he would become something so important in Jade Legacy, but he did. I think the organiz yeah. the organization or organizational structure of the well of, of the clan allows a lot of supporting characters to shine in the future. And yeah. Lot Jin is just one of the examples. And so do you plan Lot Jin from the first book to be that important in Jade Legacy? I uh, didn't plan everything, but what mm. happens is I populate the story with these side characters um, and I know how the clan will evolve and mm. where the story is going. And then some of those characters rise up and they end up becoming really important. Um, and it feels very organic actually um, in, in Lot's case. Yeah. Lot is really, he is, uh, he is who Andin could have been. Mm. So he and Andin have, um, they have mirrored character arcs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it starts in Jade City, Andin is the one who thinks he will become um, a, a clan member for life who will work his way up through the clan and and potentially become the horn. Yeah. And it is low, it's Lot who is opposed to that. He's like, I don't yeah. want to be part of clan life. And so the circumstances of their life flip their trajectories and they end up on each other's paths. And so that's I that when in that moment when actually it was really in Jade City, when Lot steps up to take the oaths to Hilo mm -hmm. in the graduation yeah. ceremony that I, I knew, okay, he's gonna come back in some way. He's, uh, he, he, when he did that, I was like, okay, he's all in. And that means he's coming back. And in Jade War, um, there's a scene where they go to the Uiwa Islands and Lo mm -hmm. and Hilo have this conversation in the airplane. 
Um, and, uh, and that's like a, a moment that I felt like I dialed in their character, both of their characters more. And I like, okay, I, I like load. I, I like where this is going. And so he just kept kind of, he became this, and in, in that scene in the air, airplane, Hilo was wishing that it's Andon who's sitting there, you know, who's, that he's having this conversation with. Mm-hmm. That's, I knew in that moment that like, okay, their paths, they, they are, they're, they're each other's mirrors. And yeah. so they're, uh, and, and, um, and so like, yeah, I'm, I'm really fond of, of Mo Jin and I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm, not, I'm proud of him. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he he achieved great things, <laughs> and it's not only Lodgin. I I think there's one more character. I really love this character, even though his appearances are not that many. It's Vin. Yeah. Oh, Vin the sniper. Vin. Oh my God, see, he's he's awesome. <laughs> he's so awesome. <laughs> his uh Vin and his perception. You add a sniper skill. To, uh, you add a sniper capability to that. It became something truly incredible. And well, do you have plan to write maybe more books uh, featuring more supporting characters? Because you have a lot of supporting characters, amazing supporting <laughs> characters. <laughs> um, I mean, I I could, but also I do. I I've written so much. I hope some yeah. people <laughs> fanfic with some of these side characters. That would be lovely. <laughs> um, yeah, there's definitely characters that I just. I mean, they, uh, when they walk on the page, um, mm. I just become, I, they kind of grow a little more than I, than I even, and Vin, Vin was one of them where it's like, he doesn't, he's, this is a very minor role, but like, yeah, role is very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and um, yeah, and I, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed his, um, his, his scenes because I remember all like, you know, in, in Kung Fu movies, there's like often like a, a master who, who is blind or he's blindfolded, but he can like, you know, just sense where someone is and like, you know, throw a knife and like it hits the assassin who's like yeah. hidden in the rafters or something like that. Right. And like, Oh, but what would that look like in like modern era with like uh, sniper rifles? Sniper you know? rifles. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 yeah so Vin oh. was, and you know, Vin um, actually, I had no plans to do anything with him, um, but in there was a scene early on in Jade War mm-hmm. where he goes to the Uiwa Islands with Hilo and he makes himself quite useful because his perception is so good. So okay. one of the nice things about having the six disciplines is people can be of different strengths and have sort of different specialties among those six Jade disciplines. And so like mm-hmm. I could kind of play with like, uh, what cool capabilities individual people would have based on like their strength and different different jade abilities. So when I introduced Vin and Jade War, I'm like, oh, this guy with really cool perception. Like, I wonder, I wonder if I'm going to do anything else with him. Hmm, interesting. And then like in Jade <laughs> Legacy, um, you know, the nice thing about having a big cast of characters is there's always like, there, there's always kind of people who can rise up and there's always mm. need for people to rise up. It's yeah. almost like having an organization where you can kind of like look at all these, like there's, it, it, it does feel pretty organic sometimes where you're like, oh, this, this thing has to happen in the plot. Well, who can help that? Well, hey, I have this guy with awesome perception back from <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's really understandable. And well, I think it all flows so organically. Uh, I wish there's more of him. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. you know, another, another um, uh, we, uh, character that, I brought that I I enjoyed bringing in Uh, was um, A10, the fist uh, loses his arms and then he becomes the owner of the Cursed Beauty Distillery and he plays a big role in in, in Jade War and he meets Barrow and then his daughter becomes friends. Like I, I it's mentioned in Jade War that he has this daughter who's really fussy and spirited Mm. and in in Kekini's, um superstition she's going to grow up to be a great warrior i'm like oh okay interesting and then <laughs> it turns out she's a, kind of around the same age as hilo's daughter and of course they become friends and yeah so those when you're writing a story with a lot of with a with a uh basically a, well with a clan yeah spanning time um it's all it you you're uh 
you're kind of um, seeing how these characters turn out almost like uh, like watching them grow up and, yeah. and you can uh, you can go back to threads that you've laid in previous books and pull on them and sort of see where they take you in the next book. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, speaking about growing up, uh, we have to talk about Nico <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, Nico, uh, he was such a good kid. <laughs> he was such a lovely kid. I wish I could show you the screenshot of me talking with my co brokers. We were saying that, oh, he, Nico is such an awesome kid. He's going to grow. He's going to grow. He's uh, becoming a, such a great pillar. He's going, oh, we keep on saying nice things about it. And then, uh, Rue was acting at first like a spoiled brat, right? Because he, he's, uh, he's a stone knight. And because of that, and then <laughs> not long after we said that, the next chapter, <laughs> Nico rebel, like really badly about, why? <laughs> why do you do this? <laughs> oh my God, it's, it's so good though. It's really so good. And uh, we have to, uh, after Nico, and then there's also Rue's, uh, his... Oh my God, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, it it was absolutely heartbreaking. That was the part where we really, all of us all, almost cried. I think my friend really cried at that scene, hard. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the, why? <laughs> why do you do that? <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time reading that scene even. I've, I wrote it <laughs> and I yeah, have to revise yeah. it many times, many times oh, yeah. I do to read it over and over again, Patrick, yeah. <laughs> over yeah. and over again. Uh, so, um, so Rue's, uh, Rue's death is, it's so tragic because it's the natural consequence of the, that like, oh, the, the extremely macho toxic greenbow culture yeah. that he grew up in, right? Because so much of this saga is sort of the, the, the pride and the, the honor and the, um, the, the, I mean, the coolness of the mm. green bones and, um, and they're, you know, they have this custom of, of, of dueling and, um, and there's, there's so much of a sense of, um, of like this warrior ethos and, and infused into, um, into the, in the way they live. And um, I also didn't want that to, to get away, to kind of get away with that without consequence. And to like, it had to sort of, um, I think there needed to be a point in this narrative where you realize actually the way that these people live leads to so much unnecessary pain. Yeah. Um, and that, well, that was, that's the scene with Nico. Like that is where Hilo realizes like the way he is, like he, like I mentioned how Hilo is really the embodiment of green the, bone. of the green bone way of life. And he's just, he's so bought into its morals, into its traditions. Um, and that's the moment where Hilo realizes like he, he loves his son and the way that uh, he raised his son is part of the reason, is the reason why he's dead. Um, yeah. And so, so in a, I, I feel like Rue's death mirrors Lon's death mm. um, because they, and, and so there's sort of this narrative echo that happens because um, Lon's death is it is really um, also a result of the pressures that he's under, uh, yeah. it, it, because of the the expectations of, mm. of his family and his society and his role. And Rue feels that same way, but he's a and he's a, a stone eye. He doesn't have any jade yeah. powers, but he's trying mm. to live up right to like his family. Um, and so, like after that, I think you see you see Hilo that has an effect on him and, and how he behaves and, and totally, yeah, totally know, of things. And the, so that's um, yeah, 
That's uh... well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, well done. <laughs> so yeah, I think this is, uh, conversation is has been long enough, and we will move on to the final few questions. And so let's talk about the ending. You have seen, like, like, like you said earlier, you have seen uh, where Anden will end up at the end of Jade Legacy. And do you see where Hilo will end and Aitmada? I knew where Aitmada and Anden would end because ah. I had that final scene. In yeah, my yeah. Mind. I knew, I knew where there it would go. Um, I also, I knew fairly early on where Hilo's where he would end up and and how nico would become pillar and yeah. um but i like also resisted it because i like didn't, didn't oh. so for i mean um when i got to that to writing that part i kept bargaining with myself i was like is there a way that it can end differently because uh. <laughs> i didn't i didn't want to write Rose death. I and and but um but it was that but I knew that it had to happen. I knew that was the right ending. Um that felt right because this saga is really about this generation of the Cole family and this this generation of of green bones. Um it it really begins with uh with Lawn as kind of coming into power as pillar and the war the long war with the mountain is kicked off with Hilo becoming pillar. And so I knew that the end of this book was kind of also going to be sort of a passing of the torch, like a, the, the, the close of one dynasty, if you will, and like yeah. the start of a new dynasty. So I knew that was where it had to end. Um, and it was, it was hard. It's hard, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can totally understand why it's so hard to write. But it it worked though it really worked I think that was that was definitely one of the best ending that I've read seriously it's one of the best so oh. good <laughs> yeah. Go yeah so this is the the last question so you have wrote an entire trilogy it's a it's quite a large trilogy <laughs> and what are the most painful scenes to write and what are your favorite scenes to write in the entire trilogy oh gosh yeah. There's so many. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, most most painful scenes are are the character deaths, yeah. um, the major character deaths. Those those are hard for me to write because I do become um, a touch. I, I get I I have to know these characters really mm. well um, in order to kill them, uh, and so that that's those are those are painful scenes to write. Um, and, uh, but I also, but on some weird level, I also enjoy them because I know that they are the, the really important scenes. They're ones that will stay with readers. Um, so yeah, so those are, those are painful. Um, mm. And, uh, and I wouldn't call them painful exactly, but I would say they're, um, a lot of the scene, so some of the, the scenes where there's the characters really struggle with each other, where like um, like there's the scene in the end of Jade War where where he where Shay goes to tell Hilo what's happened. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that that was intense. <laughs> that was a, that was a, I knew that was a scene I knew was coming. You know, ever yeah. since when went behind. Uh, Hilo's back in Jade City. I knew this. It's gonna. It, it, the truth will come out. Um, it's just a matter of where and when. Um, and, uh, and so that yeah, you know, scenes like that where the characters are in so much pain with each other. Those can be hard scenes to write to. Uh, so yeah, those are those are the painful ones. And then favorite ones. You know, yeah. I mean, I have talked at length about how I love the action scenes. Yeah. Um, I mean, those those are always. Uh, they're always just fun for me, um, enjoyable. I've talked about the dialogue scenes and mm. how I really, I, I put a lot of work into those. And so they're very satisfying. Yeah. But some of my favorite scenes, honestly, are those, are the smaller family character moments. Uh, this is a book with like some very big events and some yeah. global scale uh, politics and, and, and action pieces. 
but there's also some little moments of parenting and mm -hmm. um and family moments where that i just uh, uh that i just love i i love those moments like like um ones where uh you know they're at the at the dinner table and mm. um what like there's uh there's there's a scene in in jade legacy where um jaya gets into trouble and uh, has yeah. to go pick her up and <laughs> they have a father-daughter conversation and uh and some of those scenes are just there I, I really enjoy them i enjoy some of those small family the the character moments where they act like we see these people as as just people um yeah. who have you know relationships with with their family members um yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, those are those are some unex uh, sort of the quieter unexpected ones mm, i mean they may be small but their impact is huge without those scenes a lot of the intensity won't work those scenes needs to happen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. even the ones like you know, uh, Hilo playing with his kids, or mm. you know, Nico. Oh, Nico and Rue um, messing with the Jade and having to go <laughs> to the emergency room. That's, yeah, yeah. As a parent, that is such a so plausible. Exactly what would happen <laughs> yeah. if you left these unsupervised children with Jade accidentally out. Yeah, exactly. Like those sort of moments where, like, you rush your your child to the hospital because yeah. something stupid has happened. Like, this just <laughs> felt very. Those are those real moments, those human moments. I I enjoyed those. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's it for today's uh, for today's conversation. It has been it has been really a blast to have you visiting my channel. Seriously, thank you so much, Pondali. And uh, for those of you who haven't picked up, if you're still watching this, if you haven't picked up the Green Bone Saga, please do it seriously. It's the best completed trilogy that I've read so far. It's absolutely a masterpiece. And yeah, thank you so much, Pondali, for visiting the channel. Seriously, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you so much, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.